All right, everyone. Um, we're, we're about to start our afternoon program with our first panel of the afternoon, which is Indigenous Reconciliation and Development. I'm going to introduce our moderator, Diane Francis, then she'll introduce her panelists, and we'll begin the panel discussion. So we're very happy to have with us Diane Francis. She's a member of our executive committee. She's an award-winning journalist and columnist, editor-at-large at the National Post, senior fellow Eurasia at the Atlantic Council, Kleptostro kleptocracy, kleptocracy initiative of the Hudson Institute, and importantly, a longstanding member of our Canada-United States Law Institute. Diane is a prolific writer and author of many books and has been very busy keeping on top, researching and analyzing the important current events of today, including the war in the Ukraine, the conflict in Gaza, the actions of Iran, the expansion of China in foreign affairs, as well as other issues that are in her blog, which is very, very well researched and very interesting to read. I recommend it to all of you. Her reports are very well researched and provocative, and she makes us all think. So here to introduce her panel and moderate this discussion, Diane. Thank you very much. Well, we kind of lost our crowd. I guess they finished her sandwiches. It isn't anything we said, that's for sure. OK. Um, so this is going to be interesting. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, briefly uh, introduce the two panelists here. And they're going to speak for 10, 15 minutes a piece. Um, and, and, uh, and then I'm going to kick it off with an overview. Um, because I think our task is to look at um, how the two countries vary in how they provide rights to the indigenous, uh, what they are or aren't doing regarding reparations, and then how they are or aren't advancing economic development for indigenous people. Uh, so it's a, it's a tall order, and we'll touch on some of those. So uh, I'm, I'm going to give the overview, but first of all, I'll be followed by Winona Single, and I think uh, Jim Blanchard very beautifully introduced her uh, with all of her wonderful accomplishments. And she's the Director of Indigenous Law and Policy Center, Associate Professor of Law at Michigan State U. Um, and she's going to give the U.S. perspective. And giving the Canadian and U.S. perspective is Wayne Garneau Williams, Acting Chief, Chief Executive Officer, National 60s Scoop Healing Foundation of Canada, Founding President, Intertribal Trade and Investment Organization, Past Chair, Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations Appeal Tribunal. I'm going to kick off because I've written a lot about it. You can't be a, a business writer or a, a political writer in Canada uh, without uh, touching on the indigenous situation. But I think there's a lot of um, unknowns on the part. Americans really don't know how different our system is and vice versa. So I'm going to give you the overview. Um, Canada has about 1.12 million indigenous people. The United States has 2.79 million. Um, the major difference is my understanding that under international law, which is why we call our tribes or our tribes call themselves First Nations, is that they are internationally recognized as nation states. So if our federal government or anybody wants to do any interactions with them, they have to treat them and have a treaty as though you're dealing with an autonomous nation state. In that respect, and we've awarded them all the sovereignty and rights accorded to having 630 nation states inside our country. And this is complicating, and it's not without trouble. And uh, it does fragment the power base of Canada. It also fragments the decision making when it comes to economic development approvals political policies, and so on and so forth. Um, the indigenous in Canada pay no taxes, get all the benefits. Their First Nations are given 
untold billions, it's hard to get the exact figure every year, as an allowance, if you like, to run their affairs, uh, keep the lights on, and build the roads and so on in their reserves, take care of their people, build housing. The problem with the Canadian situation is not only we have 630 First Nations, but they are not exactly, they haven't exactly settled who owns what themselves. So you have overlapping claims by various bands. So for instance, I served uh, on the board of directors of two uh, man gold mining companies, both listed in the New York Stock Exchange. We had a mine in Quebec and one in Ontario. And every time we would announce we discovered half a million uh, ounces of more gold uh, on our properties, we'd have six lawyers writing from six different bands with overlapping claims to that piece of our property. This is the reality in Canada. It is a problem. Uh, in 2015, the current government handed over total sovereignty to these First Nations, uh, meaning that, and this raises another problem in terms of dealing with human rights in Canada and uh, for the Indigenous and for other people, is that by so doing, they have actually uh, enshrined a power base of 630 First Nations that are not accountable to the Constitution of Canada. I'm not exaggerating. Um, I have a very close woman friend who I work with who's a constitutional lawyer named Catherine Twin. She was a minister uh, in the Alberta government for social services. She's a full-blooded Samson uh, member of the Samson tribe, and she does case after case of women inside reserves who have been divorced by their native husbands and thrown out of their house, thrown out of the band, and thrown away and denied the, the band revenue allowance that other members of the band have with no recourse unless you go to court. Uh, they also, the government also decided to, uh, in 2015, not require these 630 First Nations to um, have checks and balance on their elections and or uh, judicial oversight on the laws and things that they do, uh, or to have outside police force enforcing the laws inside their reserves. And uh, this is another enormous problem. Many of these leaders are hereditary so they're not elected. So there's a whole accountability problem, and so you have a very fragmented uh, economy as a result of it, and it's very hard to get, to get things done. Um, they, uh, they used to, until 2015, they used to have to, each chief would have to account for the money they were given from the federal government and publish their, their financial transactions in their accounts to their tribal underlings, if you like. And that, that ended. They don't have to do that. So my friend Catherine Twin, uh, along with the Canadian Tax Affairs Federation, is fighting a case in Saskatchewan, it's gone on for five years, for a, a female member of a band who wants to see why there's no clean water in her reserve and where all the millions of dollars have gone and what they've spent it on and we, we haven't, she hasn't gotten anywhere with it. It's going through the court appeal process. And so this is a very serious issue that I don't think Canadians quite understand uh, is, is, uh, is, is going on right now. In the United States, it's a different deal. Uh, there, aren't, uh, there, there isn't the autonomy and the sovereignty granted to, to the bands, I don't know how many different bands they are, I don't know how they're defined, I don't know how you join one. There's no blood test or anything, no genetic testing in Canada, and a lot of people claim they're part of a, a band that maybe not, maybe are, but people don't have control over that, only the tribal leaders do. So, and then on top of that, of course, in both countries, we face the terrible intergenerational trauma problem that afflicts indigenous peoples everywhere. Australia has the same thing. And um, my, my understanding is that the reason why uh, Canada has a different uh, sovereignty structure with its indigenous people is because they were never conquered under international law. They were not conquered. 
the tribes made deals with the crown. Uh, if you recall your uh, history, American Revolution history, about half of the redcoats or the British soldiers that came down to stop the rebellion were actually indigenous people, Mohawks and Iroquois, who decided to become mercenaries for the, for the British in order to get, get a nice land claim for their, their group. So it's, it's a very, very different situation. Um, and so it, with that overview, um, then I think it's really important to drill down and get the U.S. and the Canadian perspective from these folks who are on the ground who are also indigenous themselves. And, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. I think it's, uh, it's, it's the, these historical facts and these, the structure, the legal structure in Canada in particular, and probably also in the United States, I don't know how the land claims work there, um, are, um, are, 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 are the biggest impediment to economic development. So on that note, and by the way, the Australians uh, have the same situation as Canada where their aboriginals were not conquered, they made a deal with the crown, and so they have special rights and, and so on. But there's really basically one tribe of indigenous people there, so it's not like the uh, patchwork quilt that Canada has. So Winona? Over to you. Yeah, miigwech. Ani buju, bijukwe indigenikas, maingan and dodam, wabanang nakwejang and dayan nongam. My name's Winona Single, and it's a really uh, a great honor to be here. And so I wanted to talk about um, the concept of reparations for past violations of human rights. But first, of course, I need to talk a little bit about those original human rights wrongs that um, occurred in US history um, before I can delve into the concept of um, how we might think about remedies. And also, I want to acknowledge that um, someone who is a mentor of mine, who I really have incredible respect for, Eva Potosky of the Grand Traverse Band, um, came up with this phrase, which is, from the doctrine of discovery to a doctrine of recovery. And I love that. I think that's, that's phenomenal. Um, and so the doctrine of discovery, um, along with slavery, is one of the original sins of the United States. It's a decision last year, which we marked the uh, bicentennial of. It was decided in 1823. And of course, as many of you may know, the, do the, the case uh, called Johnson v. McIntosh, decided by the US Supreme Court in 1823, held that the tribes only had a right of use and occupancy in uh, the United States and did not have full, complete ownership ownership of all of the rights that we might associate with property rights to their lands, and that furthermore, they lacked the power to transfer their property to anyone they might choose to transfer it to, but that only the United States, as the successor in interest to the original discovering nation, had the power to extinguish Indian title through purchase or conquest. And of course, um, the uh, um, the United States decided very early on that it did not have the resources and it did not, it was not will, uh, willing to undertake the risk of engaging in warfare with the tribes in order to acquire uh, their property interests. And so did not pursue conquest, but pursued purchase through the use of treaties in order to obtain a uh, full, complete title to Indian lands through a series of treaties where the tribes entered into sessions. Um, but I want to acknowledge that um, that this uh, this uh, doctrine of discovery um, was incredibly harmful uh, for Native people, and I also want to acknowledge that the decision itself is imbued with uh, racist stereotypes, um, which were patently false regarding Native people. Uh, it described tribes and used this rhetoric to justify its decision as fierce savages whose occupation was war, um, as na as people who were subordinate to the superior genius of Europe. Um, and also, the uh, Chief Justice Marshall had said in his opinion that to leave the country to the Indians would be to leave the United States a wilderness. Um, and another justification, of, of course, is also that Justice Marshall found that the doctrine of discovery had already been adopted as part of the law of nations. And so he had no choice but to perpetuate it um, and continue to apply it, although he did fundamentally, in some very important ways, alter that rule as it had been applied by other nations um, who had been considered discovering nations. 
So this principle, which fundamentally denies tribes their full property rights, um, results in violating uh, foundational principles of, uh, of our democracy in the United States, um, including uh, justice, equality, uh, respect for human rights, uh, non-discrimination, good governance, uh, good faith, and government accountability. Um, and effectively, the doctrine of discovery and its uh, it's troubling uh, description of Native people as fierce savages um, whose uh, occupation was war, um, that this uh, ultimately um, embeds within our legal system systemic race discrimination. Um, and it serves as the very foundation of all property law in the United States. Um, and so what I also want to acknowledge is that um, this resulted in profound underpayment uh, of uh, land sessions, of compensation for land sessions to the tribes because the doctrine of discovery by holding that the tribes could only transfer to the United States created effectively a monopsony, meaning that there's only one buyer for tribal mm -hmm. lands. And as a result, that one buyer, the federal government had the power to dictate the price without any competing uh, market participants. And so from the 1776 to 1871, about 374 treaties were entered into between the U.S. and tribes, and the average payment per acre in those treaties was 4.75 cents per acre. Um, and then in addition, after 1871, um, the United States Congress also unilaterally uh, adopted many statutes which also provided for additional sessions of Indian lands uh, for compensation. And so not only are these uh, forms of compensation wholly um, inadequate, um, but in addition to that, uh, many uh, sessions were made which were not compensated for at the time of the taking of Native lands. Um, during, uh, after 1871, uh, there remained many treaties which uh, provided for sessions of Indian lands where there no compensation had been paid. So Congress formed the Indian Claims Commission um, and in the tw early 20th century that awarded about $818 million uh, to tribes and later uh, after the um, end of that period, the Federal Court of Claims also provided another four to five hundred million dollars for Indian land sessions um, to tribes. Um, and then there are also other federal statutes that have compensated tribes for the taking of Indian lands. However, what I want to acknowledge is that um, this form of compensation, again, uh, always represents a fundamental underpayment because it does it uh, it never is compensation. It never includes adequate fair market value for the uh, for native lands, and is always based on the fact that the U.S. is the sole exclusive purchaser of native lands. Effectively, uh, what the doctrine of discovery did is it's a taking of the right to transfer because it deprived tribes of the right to transfer their property to anyone they might de they might want to transfer that property to, fundamentally resulting in um, this underpayment. In addition to that, uh, there's another very important um, Supreme Court decision in U.S. history regarding tribal property rights called Tiatan versus the United States. It was decided in 1955, and in that case, the Supreme Court held that when the United States takes a, what's called original Indian title, which is title that's never been ceded in a treaty or ceded by statute, that that taking uh, is not uh, subject to the Fifth Amendment of the U.S of the US Constitution's Just Compensation Clause. And so unlike any other taking of anyone's property rights in the United States, which requires just compensation, that principle, that constitutional right does not apply to tribes' original Indian title in the US. It's a horrible decision, and yet again, another fundamental deprivation of human rights for Native people. And also, it has dramatic and important fiscal consequences because many tribes, as I mentioned, never did not originally receive the money that they were entitled to. And only in, so there may have been uh, treaties entered into in the early to late uh, 19th century, which were not compensated for until the late 20th century. And in those cases, when uh, the US government does eventually provide the compensation that it, uh, that it committed itself to in a treaty or statute, um, it does not, is not obligated to pay interest from the moment that the compensation was, um, was agreed to by the U.S. because interest is only payable uh, for a, a taking that is subject to the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. 
So if you can imagine, when you don't include the payment of interest for a taking, uh, then that's actually depriving uh, the payee, the tribe in this case, of the grand majority of the value that they would otherwise be entitled to. And so they receive just the, um, the US's determination of the value of the property uh, that was originally agreed to in the treaty or the statute. So there's never been uh, a claim of tribes that has, uh, that has successfully um, sought the um, setting aside of Tiatan and this principle that the Fifth Amendment does not apply to tribes. Nor has there been ever been a successful attempt to set aside the, the, the opinion of Johnson v. McIntosh. And that case and its doctrine of discovery uh, continues to be cited and applied um, in the federal courts throughout the United States to this very day. And so uh, I also want to acknowledge that um, the doctrine of discovery resulted in traumatic dispossession of tribes across the United States, with tribes losing 98.9% of their original Indian lands. And also, tribes were frequently removed far from their homelands. An extreme example of that is the Modoc, which was moved over 1,500 miles from their homelands in California to Oregon. And of course, many tribes, as you know, were removed from the southeast Eastern United States to Oklahoma, and tribes in the Midwest also were uh, were removed um, to Kansas and then Oklahoma as well. Um, on, in, on average, tribes were removed uh, 150 miles from their original homelands. And this is critical because their homelands are really the place where their culture and spiritual beliefs um, uh, are founded. And so uh, this has... Um, Many of these uh, areas where tribes were removed to are also uh, lacking in the richness of resources that their original territories had, making, the, and making those lands, in many cases, not arable, not suitable for agricultural development or other development. And so uh, and that's another form of loss. The removal of tribes in their dispossession has also caused many other forms of losses for tribes. And this is really personal for um, everyone who's native and has affected us all. But it has included um, a loss of political freedom, a loss of tribal governance authority, diminishing tribal jurisdiction, loss of language, destruction of culture, and loss of family attachments. Uh, one of the express uh, policies that was also aimed at further the dispossession, furthering the dispossession of Native people in the United States, which is uh, similar to the history of Canada and Australia, is uh, the fact that Native children uh, were, have historically uh, been removed from Native families. And we, although this occurred from the very beginnings of um, the foundation of the Republic, it also, of course, was absolutely um, uh, used um, uh, free throughout the United States during the era of the use of Indian boarding schools, uh, and also in the 20th century through the use of the removal of Native children from their families and their placement into non-Native foster care and, uh, and non-Native adoptive homes. And so, uh, as many of you know, um, in the United States, we call them Indian boarding schools. In Canada, Indian residential schools. But these were schools where children were forcibly removed from their families. In some cases, their, their parents may have consented to their enrollment at these schools. But these schools are widely recognized as being places of multiple forms of abuse, from physical and psychological and sexual abuse to malnutrition um, to uh, substandard medical care and widespread um, disease. And as we know, we have many locations in Canada and in the United States where we have unmarked graves of Native children. And uh, everyone that you talk to who is Native in Canada or the U.S. has ancestors who attended these schools. And these schools forbid the um, children from speaking their language or practicing their culture or wearing their regalia. And often they required that older children participate in the abuse of younger children. Um, uh, it was just 
a horrific um, uh, setting, institutional setting, where children did not grow up learning any of the parenting skills that their own communities and parents would have um, exposed them to. And also they experienced so much trauma that in adulthood, many of the survivors of these schools really struggled. Um, the schools also did not um, adequately prepare children in academic studies and oftentimes uh, used much of the time to require that children participate in manual labor. Uh, and so they did not have, um, you know, significant economic opportunities for employment upon leaving uh, these schools. In the U.S., we had 408 of these Indian boarding schools across 37 states. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, ultimately in the 20th century, it was recognized that it was far cheaper to simply remove Native children from their families and place them into non-Native foster care or adaptive homes than to put them in an Indian boarding school and pay for their institutionalization for their entire childhood. Mm -hmm. So based on that very dark economic calculation, uh, the U.S. adopted a, a widespread policy of removing Native children from their families for adoption and foster care. And from the 1950s to the 1970s, over one-third of all Native children were removed from their families in the United States. And over 90% of them were placed with non-Native families, oftentimes very far from their tribe's communities, because that was part of the intent, was to separate them from their community. In my own family, uh, my grandparents both went to Indian boarding school in Michigan, and uh, when they had five children, all five of their children were removed by Catholic um, social services in Detroit, and my mom and one of her sisters were, my mom was placed into foster care from infancy until age five, and then what, she was adopted with one of her sisters by uh, a white Catholic family in Detroit. But she also had siblings that aged out in foster care, living in foster care until they uh, reached majority. Uh, and so we also have many other impacts from these harms, including, uh, uh, of course, dis dis disproportionate uh, uh, poverty and unemployment statistics, health disparities. Um, uh, the trauma has also led to um, impacts for psychological and social well-being. Um, and also we have um, hot, very high rates, disproportionate rates of youth suicide um, in our communities. Um, and also Native people are, um, it's very difficult for Native people to be, to learn about their traditional teachings and to practice their culture if they have this history of forcible assimilation in boarding schools or through Indian adoption and foster care. So this is a widespread uh, problem. Again, in my own family, my own, I have two children who are teenagers and they are the first generation in five generations not to experience removal from their family. So this is a cycle that's been repeating over and over and over again, uh, and it's one that we absolutely need to break and we need to remedy. And when we think about the, um, the impact of intergenerational trauma, we're just beginning to learn that it includes um, you know, not only uh, behavioral context that can influence the next generation as they grow and develop, but it can also include impacts um, that are epigenetic, where um, the, you know, profound stress of one generation can turn off or on certain genes that can impact the next generation and make them perhaps more inclined to experience certain diseases. Um, so remedies. There are lots of possible uh, remedies and other examples. So for example, in Australia in 2021, Australia adopted a $280 million settlement for survivors who re remove from their families. And in Canada in 2006, nearly $2 billion was um, set aside for former students of Indian residential schools. Um, the U.S. has not provided any form of compensation for those who were placed into Indian boarding schools or uh, those who were removed from their families in the 50s through the 70s. Uh, and in addition, we do have some forms of reparation in the U.S. For example, the U.S. did um, agree to pay $1.6 billion in reparations for over 82,000 uh, Japanese Americans who were incarcerated in internment camps um, during World War II. Uh, but, uh, but we don't have any uh, movement toward a successful um, opportunity for reparations for Native people um, 
in the Indian boarding school or adoption context. And we don't have successful movement for compensation for the denial of the right to transfer property rights or for the denial of the Fifth Amendment right to just compensation and the corresponding interest rule. So I think there are lots of additional remedies that we need to think about, which include uh, land back. So we need to support tribes in their attempt to um, to obtain more property interests um, through direct fee transfer of property to tribes and allowing those tribes to put those lands in trust, and also expanding tribes' uh, rights with regard to land that might be held by land conservancies or by other governments, other jurisdictions. Uh, in addition to that, um, there also are other forms of support that, we, that can be meaningful, such as support for tribal exercise of self-determination and self-governance, and support for tribes as they exercise their civil and criminal jurisdiction and develop their tribal courts. Um, so that all is important. Um, but ultimately, we need a very full and complete honest accounting of the past harms to Native people in order to ensure we stop this cycle uh, of abuse uh, and continued harm to Native people. Um, I just want to close on an, one, one note as well, since this is, uh, does relate to Canada-US relations. And one of the ongoing disputes is line, Enbridge's Line 5, which of course is a 645-mile uh, oil and gas pipeline from Superior, Wisconsin, through Michigan, the Upper Peninsula, across the Mackinac Straits, through the Lower Peninsula, and reaching then to Sarnia, Ontario. And the tribes in Michigan and Wisconsin vehemently oppose the continued operation of Line 5. Line 5 crosses a 12-mile expanse of the Bad River Bands Reservation in northern Wisconsin on Lake Superior. And the, reserv and the tribe um, has an easement uh, from dated 1993 with Enbridge that expired in 2013 after 20 years. And so the tribe uh, brought a claim seeking the uh, session of, uh, of oil and gas flow through Line 5 um, as it crossed the reservation. And so that is still in litigation. Uh, clearly, it's um, it, the Enbri the court, federal district court, has determined that Enbridge is in trespassing across uh, tribal lands, but has given it until 2026 um, to stop operations. Meanwhile, Enbridge is attempting to uh, to create a loop around the reservation rather than crossing it. But in addition to that, the uh, state of um, excuse me, uh, Canada has also um, challenged any attempt to shut down Line 5 um, immediately or in the future on the basis that it has a 1977 pipeline treaty with the United States. And that pipeline treaty specifically prohibits either country from interfering with the flow of oil and gas pipelines across the uh, Canada-US uh, border. And so the... Uh, However, that treaty also includes an, an important exception, and the exception is that states, uh, that either country can apply their own uh, reasonable and non-discriminatory um, regulations that are that serve purposes such as environmental protection um, and uh, safety, and so uh, so there is a conflict um, where uh, Canada is objecting to the tribe's attempt and the public's attempt to shut down Line Five. And uh, the U.S. Department of Justice recently asked um, the uh, Seventh uh, Circuit Court of Appeals uh, to uh, consider, uh, or the court, they want the courts on remand to consider um, the impacts for diplomatic relations um, as a result of a possible violation of this 1977 treaty with Canada. So that's in direct conflict with the tribe's attempt to assert their rights to shut down um, transport of oil across the Bad River Reservation. So with that, um, I'm sorry that I, I'm Thank sure you. I went over, but Thank you. Miigwech. We have about 50 Line 5 problems in Canada with <laughs> indigenous because they do have the rights to object and they get a piece of the action or they don't want it at all. Uh, and also, just on the note of Line 5, uh, that's just not, that's just, that oil takes care of Ohio as well as Michigan. So the industrial base of the Midwest shuts down when that line goes down. It's Ontario, Ohio, and Michigan. So it's, it's very critical. I'm not arguing one way or the other, but it isn't, it isn't just about 
Canadians getting the oil at the other end. Um, so, so that's so. There you go. There's an interesting contrast right there. You've got one country that's <laughs> you've got 631 countries in Canada, essentially, uh, because of the way we've legally handled the situation under international law, and then you have this complete dispossession. But what's interesting is at the root of both of them is this psychosocial damage that was done. And then, of course, on top of that, without making everybody totally depressed, you've got African-American slavery in the United States that has not been dealt with in terms of reparations with the same kind of you know, unfortunate intergenerational trauma. Pretty depressing. Anyway, OK, uh, next speaker. Over to you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Winona did such a wonderful job um, that you have, you have expre uh, uh, explained the area very well, uh, so much so that I do not wish to um, backtrack or go over stuff that's already been done. And as a good litigator, I always have something in my back pocket. So I'm not going to give you the presentation that, was, that, I, had, that I had crafted because Winona has done such a wonderful job. I am going to give you another one. And this one is more, more in, uh, on point with respect to this audience, this trade audience. Let me first of all um, point out, first of all, that um, whenever I uh, explain international trade from an indigenous standpoint to law students in law schools, I always start out with the reminder that as a result of the Marshall Trilogy of the 1860s uh, by Justice John Marshall, we have in the United States three sovereigns, state, federal, and tribal. And there is sovereignty of, of tribal nations in the United States. And I compare and contrast that with Canada. And I, I tell them, there's a lot of talk about self-government in Canada. Talk, because self-government is a fancy word, which is, means delegating federal authority to Indian tribes. Real authority constitutionally for indigenous peoples doesn't lie anywhere because when you look at the constitution, section in Canada, there's a division of power, section 91 and 92, federal and provincial. 91 is federal, 92 is provincial. Section 9124 of the Constitution Act of 1867 clearly establishes that the federal power goes to Indians and lands reserved for Indians. That means that indigenous people do not have sovereignty. That sovereignty has been taken away by the federal government through the Constitution. Unlike the United States, where the US Constitution makes reference, I think, to indigenous peoples three times in Obiter, and the most important one is the Trade and Commerce Clause of the United States, where it says that the federal government shall have the power to do trade and commerce with our outside nations and Indian tribes, implying that it's not an internal relationship, it's an external relationship. So that's really cool. Anyways. That being said, uh, this is really a cool concept that I'm going to be talking about instead of what I wanted to do. This is, this is something, something else I love to talk about. This is about dealing with trade, indigenous trade. Now, there's something that you probably don't know that's been happening around the world right now. There's, there's been this massive uh, opportunity for indigenous peoples to look, to work with their nation states and to develop an internal trade policy that works for indigenous peoples in their own domestic nations. Now, way back in uh, 20, I believe it was uh, 2019, the New Zealand government was the APEC chair. And they were working with the Maori, their indigenous peoples, and they said, you know, what if we start an indigenous to indigenous international trade agreement? What do you think, New Zealand? The New Zealand government said, let's do it. Okay, let's try. So got together. APEC members and said, anyone want to try and negotiate this for indigenous peoples? Four, three other nations put their hands up. It was New Zealand, Australia, Chinese Taipei, and Canada. And together, for over one year, during APEC's, New Zealand's chair of APEC, uh, an indigenous to indigenous trade negotiation was negotiated and agreed upon. And then uh, recently, as of last year, ratified. And I'm happy to say this year, the United States has asked for observer status for the first step of doing this, and then they're going to go 
around the country and knocking on the doors of various tribal nations and say, hey, what do you think of this agreement? Does it make sense for you? Do you want us to go in, 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 in or not? So this is what I'm going to be talking to you today about instead of what I, want, what I was going to do. This is called the IPECTA, the Indigenous Peoples Economic Trade and Cooperation Arrangement. So a little bit about who I am and why I'm talking about this stuff. I'm chair of the International Intertribal Trade and Investment Organization, a 501c3 educational charity organized out of Oklahoma. Our mandate is to educate, infire, in, 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 inform, inspire, elevate the discussion on international indigenous trade and to get goods and services moving for tribal nations. The whole, the whole point of this is to start from the grassroots to help tribal nations with respect to their economic challenges and bring them up uh, internally have them develop their own, their own systems and trade amongst themselves like they used to. Um, so, a little bit of what, what IPECTA is. I'm going to talk about what IPECTA is all about, what makes IPECTA different, what are the core results of IPECTA, and what's the working mechanism and the implementation of this. Because this IPECTA, if everything goes well, is coming to an area near you. And you as practicing lawyers or as professors will want to educate, instruct, inspi inspire, advise your clients or students about IPECTA. So, what is IPECTA? IPECTA is the first modern, comprehensive, international indigenous trade arrangement. It's like an MOU. It's not binding, and it's cooperation-based. It's a revolutionary instrument for not only its content and philosophy, but also for international trade inclusiveness in its negotiation, and also its implementation and governance. So it's inclusive for not just implementation, but also for governance. When I mean inclusive, I mean it's not just nation states running the show. Indigenous people are playing a role in its ongoing operations, which is really a first. Um, importantly, as well, the United, Nations, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples inspired and informed a great deal of the content of IPECTA. So what makes IPECTA different, historic and ground banking? Well, the key here is inclusiveness. The New Zealand government, in cooperation with the Maori trade negotiation, trade negotiation arm of Titomata, took the unique opportunity when New Zealand was the APEC host to lead on the development of this. And what happened with this is that there, there was a great negotiation where it wasn't just your standard trade negotiation where governments go off and they uh, have your senior ambassadors negotiate agreements and can consult with industry. It was indigenous people working alongside trade experts to develop and fashion tools to understand the indigenous lens on trade, which is different than the, uh, for want of a better term, the European-based concept of what trade looks like to you and I. So having that understanding to start out with, educating the, the trade negotiators, they're experts in what they do, but not in the understanding from the indigenous lens was the first step. And then working with them, working with indigenous peoples from each of the involved nation states and their indigenous leaders to develop this together. So what are the core results of IPECTA? Well, there's four. There's the definition of indigenous trade. There's environmental protections. There's the indigenous world view, and there's 22 to start out with indigenous trade and business topics for getting business going. The first core result, uh, the definition of indigenous trade. This is really cool. For you, for you professors, for you trade experts, for you trade geeks, this is really cool. Um, I want to read this definition a little bit. I'll, 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 I'll edit the boring stuff and I'll focus on the really cool stuff. Okay, indigenous trade and investment may be constituted in elements that include uh, trade and investment that is relational uh, and aims to build long-term networks of exchange. Two, indigenous laws and values including reciprocity, care, trust, respect, and generosity. Three, operating with an, within an intergenerational framework. And four, my favorite one, the responsibility of indigenous peoples to protect their lands, resources, and the spiritual interrelationship of the human and natural world, as well as the integrity of the natural systems themselves. Think of that from an environmental lens as well, because the whole philosophy, as you probably guessed, with respect to indigenous trade, 
is their relationship with nature and the respect with respect to the ecosystem of how to not just take from nature, but to give back as well. So it's that balance. And that's the, really, that's the real hope of IPECTA, in the sense that if we can show the world how we can manage to do international trade, but international trade that's respectful of environmental responsibility to our ecosystem. And this is this core definition allows that and, and puts that front and center. So that's really cool. Uh, the next thing is the, um, the environmental results. If it wasn't clear already, indigenous peoples and the governments wanted to make absolutely certain that environmental responsibility in trade, in indigenous trade, is first and foremost. So in Article 2, they expressly lay, list the international environmental covenants and agreements that parties have commonly take for granted, but we give them lip service. We, we forget all about them when we're doing a trade agreement. But they're, 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 they're part and parcel of this trade agreement, and they're specifically, specifically listed, like the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, the, US, uh, the, the UN Financial Development on Addis Ababa Action Agreement, the UN Framework for Convention on Climate Change, the Paris Agreement, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the UN Convention to Combat Desert Desertification, and the Convention on International Trade and in Endangered Species. All of these agreements the US is a party to, so there's no conflict. So the US can easily be party to IPECTA. Third aspect that's important here, the indigenous worldview. Participating economies recognize that existing international human rights obligate, oh, this, this is an actual phrase from Article 3. I love this. I'm going to read this because it's really cool. I love this. I love this. Okay. Participating eco economies, and this is the quote, participating economies recognize that existing international human rights obligations are intertwined interdependent and mutually reinforcing and should be considered alongside each other when advancing the rights of indigenous peoples and their participation in international trade. I love it. That is a reflection of modern trade. Human rights and trade going hand in hand in the document itself. So cool. And then of course, Article 4, the, the core, the meat and potatoes of this, the real trade when the rubber hits the road. There are 22 potential topics that just are, are basically hors d'oeuvres to get the trade going. And they're everything from access to government procurements to capital markets and supply chains to reinforcing indigenous, trade zone, uh, indigenous foreign trade zones to promoting uh, responsible business conduct. And this morning we heard an awful lot about the need for responsible business conduct. So to have that in there, certifying indigenous owned businesses and indigenous made goods so that you don't get fraudulent indigenous goods, which we have in Canada. I can go to any cheap dime store downtown and pick up a little totem that says made in China. Um, it's that kind of stuff. You've got to trace it, track it, label it, and pres preserve that opportunity. Cross-border trade processes to facilitate tracing, authenticating, and protecting indigenous-owned production and indigenous-made goods. All of these, and a lot, a lot more list. And, and the thing is, this list is not prescriptive. It's just optional, uh, optimal for the parties to come around the table and start the discussion and maybe label, hit some of the low-hanging fruit and then move on to more tangible stuff. So the next thing to understand is how is this all going to work? And that's part of the working mechanism and the implementation. Indigenous people will play a significant part in the day-to-day -day operation of IPECTA through both the Partnership Council and the informal APEC uh, caucus on Indigenous trade. There's two processes. One is internal, one is external. The Partnership Council, that's internal. And that's basically a group Three government representatives from each nation, state, and three indigenous representatives sit on the same council with all the other parties. And together, they, hit, they, they look at priorities of what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, the who, what, when, where, and why in the agreement. So indigenous inclusion in the, the levers of power are there. So there's buy-in, there's excitement, there's interest in indigenous communities to want to be part of this. The other aspect of this, of course, is the external aspect, the informal APEC caucus. This is designed to work outside the formal scope of IPECTA and mandated to work alongside the annual Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Agreement, the APEC meetings, in an effort to basically raise awareness of indigenous trade issues at the larger APEC forums so as to educate, inspire, inform, and get 
other nation states to join in, like the United States. So it's sort of a promotional aspect where all the members come together and they do a show and tell what we've been working on, what we've achieved, what we hope to achieve, how you fit in. So it's kind of cool. So in conclusion, the four hopes for indigenous trade are there in IPECTA. Uh, indigenous partnership and inclusion in the development and administration of IPECTA, respect for the indigenous worldview of cultures and the way of life, and the environmental concerns, which are part and parcel of indigenous business. And finally, the realization of real indigenous trade opportunities, moving goods and services across, across borders. That's the hope of IPECTA. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. We have a uh, little time for questions. We have uh, 15 minutes for questions. Fire away, Larry. Wayne. Do I need a microphone? Yes, yes, yes. So, so Wayne, Apecta, how, how, do, how would it work? Let's say, I, I mean, I, I like the idea. I'm just trying to figure out how it's going to work. So an indigenous group in Canada owns resources. Let's say they're hydrocarbons. You develop the hydrocarbons. You want to export them to New Zealand. Let's, let's try to figure out who would be the purchasers. Where would it go to, the, the, the government of New Zealand or an indigenous community in New Zealand that was the party to that agreement. And, and, that's the first question. Who would it go to? <laughs> Who would be the parties to the trade agreement? But what happens if the deal contravenes the climate policies, the decarbonization policies of New Zealand? How, how does that work? Okay. Because it would seem to me that the deal would be frustrated by the fact that New Zealand doesn't allow hydrocarbons to be imported. I mean, that's just a hypothetical example. How would it work? Yeah. Aspirationally, ideally, it would be nation state to nation state supported, and that's what the whole agreement is about, nation state to nation state import supported intertribal trade. But your example, uh, right now, not, the, not, not possible practically because indigenous peoples don't have the infrastructure to do hydrocarbon, the movement of hydrocarbons. However, there's an awful lot of opportunity for partnership with uh, companies that can do it, partnering with indigenous na nations to make this happen. And there's an awful lot of goodwill as long as there's an awful lot of inclusive, inclusiveness in this. So that's, that's the answer to your first question is, First and foremost, intertribal, but if not, get partners with professional organizations that can do that, and they negotiate the fine details of how that partnership's gonna work on both, both ends. Both if, if, if it's a partnership, say, in Canada and New Zealand on both ends of it, you've got four parties, two indigenous, two corporate, working together to reach that deal. That's one, that's one aspect. And of course, the nation state would be supporting that. The second thing, of course, is, how do you make sure it doesn't contra contravene? Uh, one of the things that is, at least from an environmental standpoint, the, this is one of the more rigorous envir uh, environmental standards that we have with respect to international trade agreements because, for, uh, as I mentioned, uh, up front are the environmental responsibilities that we've all been signatory to and sometimes we forget. So to have those up front is, is a check and a balance to make sure that the deal doesn't close until we've met those standards. No oil, Larry. <laughs> In other words, you could you could apply you could apply my hypothetical example to say lithium or yeah. uh, or a critical mineral, right? Which would probably be more realistic, you know, a yeah. critical mineral uh, export uh, contract yeah. would have to be subject to, from what what you said, subject to the laws of the states concerned who'd be working with the indigenous people in both countries. Yeah, uh, na naturally you'd have, to, you'd have to be in compliance with both domestic laws and with the international treaties that you've, each of the nation states have signed. 
So uh, my question is for uh, Winona. Winona, in your comments, you suggested that what we need, at least here in the United States, to deal with uh, the long list of um, the long list of catastrophes and um, trauma and uh, tragedy that has afflicted uh, the uh, indigenous people of this country, often perpetrated by the government, but also by other actors. What we need is a catalog of um, a catalog that, that we can look to where uh, these injuries are, are somehow registered uh, and then dealt with. And that made me think a little bit of a mechanism that has just recently been set up by the Council of Europe um, with respect to uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine. So there's been a, <clears throat> a register of damage that was created in 2023 uh, that is beginning uh, this spring to receive claims uh, by Ukrainians who've been afflicted by uh, Russian aggression. Um, the long list of terrible tragedies that have afflicted the indigenous people are um, traumas that often don't have a sort of clear beginning or ending, or have gone on for such a long time that it's going to be very, very difficult to get some sort of accurate um, present value of, of the damage. So how would you, as uh, an Indigenous person yourself, see um, some sort of uh, catalog like this existing? Because one of the things that, certainly from a Canadian perspective, um, we often hear about in terms of Indigenous people is, oh, we've got this residential school problem, government steps in and deals with a residential school problem. But then what happens? Uh-oh. There's another problem. There's the indigenous grapes problem. All these things keep cropping up again and again. They're not dealt with in a comprehensive way. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering about maybe some thinking that might be behind some sort of catalog that might serve to deal with this in an orderly and systematic way, like the United States did, for example, in its uh, relationship with Iran, with the Iran Claims Tribunal. So. And just to add, add to that, is, is, uh, I'm, it's a good question, but how is that going to be possible? Land claims aren't possible because you've been legally dispossessed by the Supreme Court. So, um, so a few a few comments. One is I do share your interest in a more detailed um, catalog, if you will, of the types of harms that um, Native people have experienced. And one of the um, examples that I have that comes to my mind is in the US, um, Secretary Deb Holland, who is our first uh, Native uh, Secretary of the Department of Interior, um, she has initiated a road to healing process, which is a good first step. And the purpose of this road to healing is to have a variety of listening sessions throughout Indian country, throughout the United States, where survivors and descendants of uh, survivors of Indian boarding schools can come together and testify um, about their experiences. But while I find, and I, so one of the um, early uh, listening, um, uh, road to healing listening sessions was in Michigan in my own and tribe's uh, traditional territory in Pelston, Michigan, and so I attended that. And it's it's you know incredibly painful. It's a it was a six hour um, meeting with in a high school gymnasium with tribal members from all over Michigan who, and I thought, well, I'll speak after the survivors speak, and I'll perhaps make comments as a descendant. And we had so many direct survivors who had, they themselves had attended Indian boarding school in Michigan, namely the Holy Childhood School of Jesus in Harbor Springs, Michigan, that we never even got to any of the descendants. And that was six hours of survivor testimony. And while that t testimony is now in the form of a public transcript, because it's a public um, session, it's n there's no attempt to really create a catalog, right? And to identify, well, who experienced what and um, to what degree and what might be, they be entitled to if they were to bring a claim. And I contrast that with um, my limited familiarity with the Indian Residential School settlement, where um, the settlement process includes uh, money that's set aside, but then individual um, First Nations members and can fill out a form where they identify what sorts of abuses specifically 
uh, what categories of abuses did you experience in the boarding school? How long were you in, the, were you a student of this boarding school? How long did you experience these specific kinds of experiences? What was the severity of those experiences? And, um, and all of that is taken into account in determining what that individual's um, compensation uh, ought to be. And so we don't have any kind of process like that. And one of the challenges in the US is also the fact that we have a variety of very limited statutes of limitations that um, prevent claims from being brought um, after you know, a very limited number of years after the harm is experienced. And our Indian boarding schools, uh, one of the uh, ones that operated the longest is the, is the one my grandparents went to in Michigan, which um, the last uh, year I believe that it had uh, students staying overnight as boarding school students was 1983. And uh, a lot, one of the challenges is that the statute of limitations often expires within a small number of years after the harm is directly experienced, but many of these survivors don't feel comfortable sharing their experience because it's, there's so much shame and trauma associated with it until they're elders, and it might be decades later before they're able to talk about it openly. And at that point, they're unable to bring a claim. It's time barred in the courts. And so that's a real barrier. Um, but I do believe that um, there may be other avenues. So for example, um, another possibility is for um, the tribes to consider bringing a breach of trust claim. Uh, because we saw, for example, in another case that some people might be familiar with called Cobell, it was based on mismanagement of Indian trust in Indian, individual Indian money trust accounts, uh, and over $3.4 billion was ultimately paid to this uh, uh, the members of this class action for mis mismanagement of the funds that were to be paid to these tribal members um, in, in the US. And uh, so a breach of trust claim could be brought because a lot of the money that was paid to the boarding schools, even the ones that were not federally operated but by operated by the, by the churches, they actually received federal money to operate these schools on a per pupil basis. And a lot of that money came from compensation that was owed to the tribes for their land sessions. And so you, you have money that was supposed to be paid directly to the tribe, and instead, not only was it not paid to the boarding schools, but it was paid to deprive, to acculturate children and to subject them to years of abuse and malnutrition and disease. Uh, and so uh, I think that one possibility is to bring a claim in that realm and then, um, and then Ultimately, claims like this are so significant and so large that they result in acts of Congress to um, authorize settlement. And that could then create a process for requiring the cataloging of claims so that individuals could receive the amount of compensation they may be entitled to. Um, but I, I agree that also with intergenerational trauma and with the effects of colonization changing <laughs> era after era and being cumulative, it's really difficult to, to have some kind of comprehensive approach. And I understand um, you know, frustration of those who are like, oh, we, just, we dealt with Indian residential schools in Canada, but now we're also dealing with these unmarked um, graves of the Indian residential schools. And what else is going to arise that we haven't yet addressed? And, um, and it's really difficult, because one of the um, legacies and impacts of trauma is that as I mentioned, there is so much shame. It is very difficult for folks to talk about it in the open, and uh, and they have to feel a sense of trust um, and safety. And also, um, in Michigan, we've had uh, a lot of talk about a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and uh, there was one in Maine, and not a lot of tribal members went to the meetings because they didn't feel comfortable sharing their stories before state representatives. And uh, in Michigan, we have truth and reconciliation meetings, but they tend to be strictly tribal. And so people feel more comfortable talking within, com within the community, but not necessarily sharing their stories directly with, say, um, folks from state or federal agencies. Um, and so I think we, we can also think about how can we empower our tribes through the exercise of their sovereignty and support for their legal systems to provide the healing and remedies that they most intimately understand and should, can respond to, rather than you know, trust that the federal government will come up with the, the ideal form of compensation. So I think that that's another avenue to address that problem.
If I can also take a crack at this as well, because compensation is something that Canada has had some experience with, and I personally think hindsight is twenty twenty on this. Um, uh, in, in another life, I was a senior civil servant in the Department of Justice, and I was seconded to the Indian Residential Schools Department, where I was Director General for Compensation. And I can report that as a result, of the Indian Residential School Settlement paid out more than three billion B as in billion dollars to twenty eight thousand victims of Indian Residential Schools in Canada, uh, from as a result of the abuse and this compensation through the independent assessment process, uh, 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 an independent tribunal that would determine uh, compensation, the average settlement amount was approximately $125,000. Now, for an indigenous person living uh, close to or below, slightly below the poverty line, $125,000 all at once is like a, a, an average middle class individual winning the lottery. And we all know the um, the uh, sudden wealth syndrome, which basically uh, has, has been found individuals with sudden wealth syndrome often lose their fortune quickly after receiving it. Statistically, 70% of lottery winners, regardless of the amount of winnings, lose or spend all their winnings within five years. Now, no wealth counseling was provided to those victims of, uh, of, of the re of residential schools. And uh, I advocated for, for wealth counseling. That didn't happen. Unfortunately, as a result of uh, the compensation being given out, 90% of all compensation recipients reported most of the compensation was gone within three years. There was no legacy for future generations built with that personal wealth, unfortunately. And that's a, that's a, that's a lesson learned that I hope the United States can, can learn. If there's, if there's a compensation process being brought up, there has to be a wealth advisory system that's maybe owned and operated by Indigenous people for Indigenous people as, as to how to keep that nest egg and build a legacy. Well, that's a, that's a very, very interesting insight because um, many of you will be aware that just in the past year we've had that um, film that appeared, uh, the Flowered Moon film, I can't remember the full name of it, where, you know, a similar phenomenon, pardon? Oh. Yeah. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, where, you know, uh, that was sort of front and center. But this idea of perhaps, you know, having some sort of <clears throat> set aside that would be run by indigenous people themselves, that would look after disbursement, and uh, also bestow within it, or contain within it, an idea of sort of uh, generational patrimony to this money, um, would help maybe to build something more than just, you know, pickup trucks and trips to Vegas. Um, so, yeah. You have a question? One more. Yeah. This is uh, it. This question's for Winona Miigwech. I Miigwech. Oh, I stand a little, can you hear me now? Um, I grew up in Minnesota. You talked about um, you talked about the pipeline, and I that reminded me of a similar problem in Minnesota. For years, there's been this debate about opening mines up north. And uh, in 2018, the White Earth Band of Ojibwe passed a law recognizing the rights of Minuman of wild rice. And I think my question is about um, theories of liability and enforcement mechanisms, where a project like that that you know, the state has gone back and forth on its support for the project, but in a situation where it's kind of a private-public partnership, um, you know, how, what are the different theories about how a law like that could be enforced, where it does real material, not to mention psychosocial damage, however you want to characterize it, to um, the people affected? Yeah. Well, I think it's, I, th I thought it was very fascinating when White Earth did pass the law recognizing the rights of Monoman, which is wild rice. And, um, and there are other tribes that have also recognized rights of nature. Um, and then around the world, we're seeing more movements to recognize rights of nature as well. I know that also there was a movement to recognize the rights of the Animas River, which suffered from the Gold King Mine um, disaster and uh, was contaminated as well a handful of years ago in um, in, in uh, Colorado. And so the, um, so I do think that, um, that, that when tribes participate in that through that form of law, tribal lawmaking, it, it um, contributes to, um, it, it certainly contributes to our understanding of tribal values and culture, and we can learn from those traditional um, perspectives on uh, land and resources. Um, uh, at the same time, I think there are some challenges because in the United States, tribal civil jurisdiction over non-Indians is very limited, unfortunately. And so the attempt of the tribe to regulate um, uh, you know, 
a non-Indian uh, mining company or to sue a state, for example, there's a lot of barriers associated with that, of course, state sovereign, sovereign immunity, but, um, but uh, tribes have a very difficult um, doctrine that they have to um, satisfy um, called the uh, Montana uh, test, where they have to establish that, um, that the actions of the non-Indian um, uh, threaten the health, welfare, or political integrity, or economic security of the tribe. And while that might seem really broad, um, uh, Chief Justice Ginsburg um, uh, wrote in an earlier Supreme Court opinion that we have to interpret that very narrowly because that's actually an exception to a general rule that tribes lack jurisdiction over uh, non-Indians. And so you pretty much have to have near catastrophic activities of non-Indians um, before the tribe can rely on that particular prong of Montana to assert civil regulatory or adjudicatory jurisdiction over a non-Indian. So that's a challenge. But that doesn't mean that the, white, the Whiters um, law recognizing the rights of Monoman um, has no significance because I do think that it is part of a global movement um, and, it per, and it contributes to that conversation and those learnings, uh, those teachings that we can glean from those actions. Yeah, if, if I could also add in, that the, the, the rights of nature is something that is taking an awful lot of uh, traction right now. Um, in New Zealand, again, the, the Maori uh, have, the, the, the New Zealand government in conjunction with the Maori people passed the, passed the Tu'awa Tupua Act, which basically gave the Wanganui River its own legal standing. And it allowed a committee of uh, two indigenous people and two government people to speak on behalf of the river. So that if there's a, a request to uh, re exploit resources, the, the river has its own standing in court and can defend itself. So that's really an exciting concept which has taken traction uh, through happenstance in, in New Zealand. And there's, there's actually a legislation been tabled in Canada by um, a private member's bill to make the St. Lawrence uh, its own, to give its own standing to the St. Lawrence too. I don't know where it's at, but uh, it's, it's got a lot of interesting traction. Fascinating. Okay, thank you very much. Wonderful. Okay.